Hello and welcome to Scripture Untangled, a podcast by the Canadian Bible Society. My name is Joanna LaFleur. I'm a friend of the Canadian Bible Society, and I'm going to be your guide for today's episode. On this episode, we're hearing from recording artist and musician Mike Jansen, interviewed by seasoned journalist Lorna Duick. And we're also going to hear some of his latest music based on the Psalms. So you're going to love this content. Let me tell you a little bit more about Mike Jansen if you don't know him. Music has informed and shaped Mike's entire life. His unique background in disciplines of jazz, classical, and popular music combines with his technical piano prowess. His portfolio includes commissioned pieces for the CBC, the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra, and Steve Bell, as well as original arrangements of Broadway tunes for symphony orchestras and more. He has worked and traveled and toured around the world as a musician. So I think you're going to love this episode as we dive into Mike's remarkable journey of illness, community, and the Psalms. Share this episode with a friend. We think they're going to love it too. Hello, Mike, and where are we finding you? Hello, Laura. Nice to see you. And I'm here at my studio in Toronto in my backyard that my friends built. Okay, there. that just says everything about you. Your friends <laughs> built you a studio. Okay, quickly tell us that story. It's one of those little um, laneway houses <laughs> in your crowded downtown Toronto neighborhoods. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we live in the uh, east side beaches or north north beaches. Um, which just means you can eventually get to the lake if you start driving. And uh, so I have, I had this idea of starting a, a studio in my backyard so I wouldn't you know, have to go further away and commute. Um, but right when that happened, I suffered a pretty bad injury, which we'll talk about later. And uh, so my friends were left with on the hook for building the studio. So uh, I started it, but that's about it. And uh, everything else that you see in here was friends painting and putting things up and soundproofing and everything else. Oh, that's great. And you practically live there. That's your full work day is usually there? Yeah, every day I have about 20 steps to my work. And I spend time in here writing and listening to music and composing stuff. And yeah, it's it's got a big grand piano right beside me. And uh, so it's a really great space. Oh, that's fabulous. And a couch I can see behind there. And then the keyboard. Yeah, okay, <laughs> you're, you're set. We're coming over for a cappuccino. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> it looks great in there. But Mike, you know, it has, uh, you and I go back a long way. And, and I, I would love viewers to know a little bit about yourself. And uh, and what was the music of your childhood like? Yeah, you know, I, it was like any kid. Um, I really did not like practicing one bit. Um, but I, I, my parents really made me stick with it. So I started violin when I was four years old. Um, I'm not sure I would recommend to parents starting violin. It's, it can be quite painful on the ears. But uh, in grade three, I thought I was mature enough to s start a second instrument. So I went to my parents and asked them if I could start taking piano lessons. Because uh, this was back in the days that piano was starting to be pretty cool with people like Michael W. Smith and David Meese and other people. Um, and so they said yes. And uh, so I began taking piano. And that really became the thing I really loved to do because I could improvise on piano pretty easily. Uh, which my teacher sometimes liked and sometimes didn't, depending on if I was trying to play a Beethoven sonata or just improvising. Um, and then, you know, as I grew up, because I played violin, my band teacher thought I should play the upright bass. Um, so I started that. And then, because I didn't want to take any other instrument, I was put on percussion for band. So I started playing drums. Uh, and then, you know, when you go to camp, as long as I did growing up, uh, you have to play acoustic guitar for campfires. Um, so anyway, that all led me eventually to uh, Providence Bible College for a couple years. And there I figured out I just love music and love doing it and thought, well, what do I do next? So I went to music school and did an audition there um, for jazz band because I love to improvise, but I didn't really know much about it. Um, so the first thing that the teacher said after the um, tryout was over, he said, do you play anything else? which is always the worst thing you can hear after, you know, you're auditioning. So I said, well, I said, okay, well, I'm a piano major. I can play some piano, but I don't really play jazz. I said, I, I've never been a good enough sight reader to actually be in a jazz band. So I don't know if I can do it. He said, okay, one, two, I want, he started counting off and he said, this, we're going to play B flat blues. And I, I really honestly did not know what B flat blues was. So as he counted it off, I sort of panicked, but I just quickly 
found a few notes and then just sort of kept playing them over and over again, which I guess jazz does sometimes. And at the end of it all, I checked the sheet the next morning and I was on the second best jazz band when it was all over for piano. So, um, <laughs> you know, that sort for of piano. began, um, <laughs> yeah, for piano based, nothing really. And, uh, that sort of began, you know, a launch more into piano and singing. And my sister said, you know, when you play piano, something special happens, even though I really, really wanted to be a bass player for a long time. But uh, yeah, it sort of changed my course, that addition. Wow. And your sister said something special happens. That's, I think, a great compliment because family hears us in all the corners of the of the trial, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I really honestly wanted her to say, you know, something special happens when you play bass because it just seemed a little cooler at the time. But, um, you know, she saw something, right? And our families can see, th can know us like nobody else does. So uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to her. And I never forget that. She said that to me. Okay. Well, um, let's jump ahead to your own musical career. Being at a great height, uh, y you finished your composing degree at the University of Toronto. Uh, tell us a little bit about your education as you're, you're now stepping it up from the wonderful ground of Providence Bible College, but now you're, you're at U of T. It's a big, it's a big change. It was a big change. I, I got my bachelor's from uh, Brandon University. And then um, felt pulled by God to come out here. I, I'd lost a really close friend um, that summer, right before coming out here. I lost a close friend who was really great with kids. And I thought, you know, maybe I can do something with my life that's music, but also maybe helping out with, you know, sort of high school students or something. And, and I came out to Ontario, which was far away from Manitoba. And I, I played a wedding there. And at the wedding, someone came up to me and said, hey, would you ever consider coming out here and, you know, helping out as a sort of youth intern position, uh, doing outreach stuff with, with you know, youth and kids? And I, and I said, ah, I don't know, like, this is a long way away and I'll think about it and pray about it. And the more I thought about it, I was like, you know, this might be a good, good match. And then I also got into University of Toronto for my master's, although because I came from a smaller school that allowed you to do a lot of different things. Uh, U of T was saying you only do composition, and I wasn't that good at it. So they said you have to do a year of makeup first just to see if you're any good. So I thought, well, I could maybe do this youth pastor intern position while also going to University of Toronto. And that's, Lorna, when I showed up at your front door asking if I could stay at your house for a month or two. Um, because I, I really had nowhere to live when I got there. I know. It was such a lovely story. I should tell our viewers just a bit, because now we have a housing crisis in southern Ontario. But back then, <laughs> it was just normal that, you know, you had to apply to get into somebody's place to rent. And we just laughed that you were coming in from this little town of Steinbach and thinking you could show up and just find a place to live. Good thing. Good thing we were there. <laughs> <laughs> we had a great time. And I'll good always thing remember. you were there. I mean, that was a, I was quite scared there for, for a second. Well, it's a big change coming from Steinbach, Manitoba. Yeah. And, and there you were in our, in our basement. This is what basements are for. And we had never seen keyboard music. You know, you'd have your headphone on and you'd be playing your heart out and practicing and, and, and you were like way ahead of the game. Anyway, long story short, your, your musical career just takes off. Like it just grows in a beautiful way. But let's go. In my mind, you were right at the height of your career. Your calendar is packed. You have two toddler daughters busy in Toronto, and you get stopped in your tracks with a concussion. Tell us what happened. Right. And, and you know, I had some big plans in those days. I was doing a lot of uh, orchestra shows uh, with a great singer named Sarah Sleen, and it looked like we were just, things were just sort of exploding there. And... Uh, some radio ideas I had going on for jazz and other things. And I was really excited with that. And actually we had only one daughter and our second one was on the way. We had just found out that we were pregnant uh, when all of this hit. Um, so it was a very exciting time. We'd had two miscarriages that were really, really sort of crushing over the years previous. Um, so this was like big, big news at the time. And so life was exploding in a good way in every way. 
um, when this all went down. Yeah, tell us what happened. You had an accident. Well, it was April 2016, and uh, I was a little bit upset in the stomach, not feeling that great. So I went uh, at 2 a.m., went to the washroom, grabbed some water because I thought that might help settle things down. Uh, took two swallows of water on the second one. Everything went black, and I stumbled sort of away from the sink, and I crashed into the side of the bathroom wall and then went face forward right with my face into a tile floor in the basement where we were living. And uh, I was knocked out cold. Um, and the next thing I remember was uh, my wife, Jody, came beside me and sort of woke me up and said, are you okay? What, like, what happened? And I said, I, I, I don't know what happened. I, like, I've never passed out before. I said, I, I have no idea what just happened. And she said, were you okay? Like, should we go to the hospital? And I said, I, I think I'm, I think I'm fine. And so I sort of stumbled back to bed, like, you know, I was sore, but it still move and everything. And, and then the next morning I woke up and I looked outside and everything looked a little blurry. And then I looked at my messages on the computer and everything didn't look quite right and sort of upset my eyes. And then I started talking to people and it didn't sound right and thought something's off here. And thought, let's phone one of my friends who's had lots of concussions <laughs> and see what she has to say. And she said, I think you have a concussion. Like it sounds, sounds exactly like that. So just take a few days off. Um, you should be fine, maybe a week or two at the most. And I was like, no, 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 like, I can't handle a couple of weeks off here. Like I have a whole bunch of gigs coming up and things I've got to get ready for. And as you know, if you're self-employed, you don't have a benefits program. So, you know, to keep the house being paid for and groceries on the table, you have to keep working. And uh, so I started to panic a bit and I thought, I, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do. And she said, well, just, just take it easy. It, 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 things will come back and it should be over pretty fast. But as the weeks kept going and it turned into about a month and I was feeling worse and worse, um, I couldn't really go for walks anymore without getting tremendously dizzy. Um, I was stuck in the basement almost the whole time. I tried to come up and, you know, people always said to me, like, one day you're just going to get better. You're going to wake up, you're going to shake it off, the world will look right again, and you're better. So I kept thinking that. And I remember one day about a month in, I woke up and I felt actually quite good. And I thought, it, I think it's over. And so I said to, to Jody, I said, let's go for a walk. And the only place we could think of going was the bank, which was about five minutes away. So um, we, we went for a walk and uh, about halfway there, I started not feeling so good. And by the time we got to the bank, I said to her, I said, you know, I, I got to get back as fast as possible. My eyes were just piercing headache right through my eyes. And so we sort of stumbled home. And the next two weeks, I was stuck again in the basement without really being able to do much of anything. Uh, it was so bad that... You know, people would say, ah, just put on a few movies. And I mean, I could not watch any screens. I couldn't look at any emails. I couldn't talk to people. I mean, I literally was stuck in the basement in the dark and I couldn't even put the Blue Jays game on to sort of listen to a few innings, right? I was just sort of stuck down there. The pain of a concussion is, is very debilitating. People may not realize a fall can cause that kind of concussion pain. This isn't a broken bone. This is a rattled brain. Right. And a lot of people, the symptoms are so different from person to person. Um, you know, some people literally have piercing headaches all day long. Um, for me, it was actually nausea, um, dizziness, um, and just the brain would literally freak out anytime there was noise. Um, so much so that I just actually couldn't move. I just had to sort of stay still. Um, and, and, and so, you know, the analogy I often use is if if you've driven on a major interstate or, you know, an area where there's a lot of highways converging, it's like someone dropped a massive California redwood right in the middle of all those lanes of highway. And it's sort of like the brain has all these pathways that it usually follows, like just being able to listen to someone or walking and talking or looking at your phone, walking and talking, all these things the brain can do. Suddenly those pathways are all disturbed. And there's really not much you can do until you start to feel better. So rest is the key. And that's pretty hard for a self-employed musician. 
at the height of his career with a baby on the way. And I remember, Mike, um, how your neighborhood and your church family rallied around you. You learned something about the family of God when you were in a crisis. What Tell us what you learned. You know, it was it was absolutely remarkable. Um, you know, early on, three or four weeks in, I had to cancel all these gigs. And uh, a bunch of musician friends, uh, Jacob Moon, Steve Bell, Kevin Lowton, a whole bunch of people um, started rallying around me. Uh, Steve sent out an email to a whole bunch of people saying, hey, Mike's unable to do much. Um, he probably will need some money over the next few months. He's not doing so well. Can you help out? And a whole bunch of money came in from that. Um, I had friends who were playing gigs for me um, and then sending me the money after, which was pretty, pretty amazing. Um, and then, you know, our church was everything you hope a church could be. You know, um, I remember one time looking down the street and there was a lineup of cars dropping off food. Um, friends would help out with uh, my six-year-old at the time, taking her to the park or um, thinking of Valentine's Day and giving my wife the best Valentine's Day she's ever present she's ever gotten. Um, they were just literally thinking of everything. My, my parents would come over and sort of take care of us for three weeks. Uh, meals were constantly on the table and um, people were giving handshakes with checks in their hand and, and stuff like that. And uh, it literally for years, um, people supported our lives and kept us going and, and we somehow kept our house and somehow we were given that gift of time to actually heal and actually recover, which, you know, most people don't get that in life. So I, I feel tremendously grateful to, to the people and community we had around us. And your story is a wonderful reminder for us all to keep being healers, like our, our injured friends, the, when disability hits, sickness, people need people. And you're, you're a beautiful story yeah. reminder of that. Well, I do think that um, in those times, too, you're sometimes wondering what to do, right? Like, what do I do for somebody? And and often we'll send them an email or a text and say, hey, let us know if we can do anything. And actually, the best thing you can do is just think of something, pray about it. Think of something, even if it's a tiny thing or something you just love to do, and just do it. Um, because that's sort of, it took a whole huge community really to keep our life going. Um, but it was all these little pieces that people would do to make sort of life somewhat normal when it was far from normal. Um, and, and for those who aren't injured too, like families to do things for them too, to give them breaks because, you know, caregivers, they have to, you know, they have to be there 24 seven helping and caring and nurturing and trying to get people back to health and they burn out too right and it's a hard journey for them or sometimes even harder in the long haul um, so even just helping that way giving them an afternoon off or whatever so whatever if you know someone injured or going through a hard time anything you can think of just just do it you know you know just do it those memories of those years from 2016 2017 it's 2018 it's all still fresh isn't it mike well, I'm surprised. I was thinking earlier this morning that, man, this isn't that fresh anymore. I hope I'm okay. But as soon as we're talking, it all comes, you know, flooding back. And uh, you listeners can't see the tears in my eyes all the time. But um, it's, you know, it sure me it meant an awful lot what people did for us. Pausing the conversation with Mike to tell you about the Bible course, because whether you're a seasoned Bible reader or you're just getting started on the journey, the Bible course offers a superb overview of the world's best selling book. This eight session course will help you grow in your understanding of the Bible. Using a unique storyline and visuals, the Bible course shows you how key events, books, and characters all fit together. It's great for in person groups or digital gatherings. It really can be used anywhere. You can watch the first session for free and review the accompanying course guide. Go to biblecourse.ca to learn more. biblecourse.ca. Now back to the conversation with Mike Jansen. Beautiful, beautiful reminder for us to give the gift of kindness when we can. Uh, but I, I do want to talk about one specific gift that came to you in that time of sickness. And that was, my, now my understanding is that in that painful long recovery, no music, you you couldn't even really read well, 
but a friend challenged you to just take one or two lines of the Psalms, the book of Psalms. Tell us about your relationship that begins to develop with the Bible's book of Psalms. Well, my friend Keith Martin took me out actually for sushi a few months before my injury and really passionately described how important the Psalms are. And he just said, Mike, the Psalms are so, so important in today's world. Like we, we're desperate for these honest, raw prayers before God. Mike, would you ever have time to, you know, work on some music and put the Psalms to music? I'd love to be a part of it. Like, would you ever do that? And in my mind, I was thinking, boy, it sounds like a good idea, but I don't think I'm going to have time. Um, so I sm politely smiled. But once this injury happened, um, I suddenly was in the dark with nothing but time. Um, and I was left alone sort of with my thoughts. And that wasn't that much fun because when you're left alone without any other stimulus or people around you, you're sort of stuck in this dark place of, of just yourself um, and, and the things that come out of that. Um, and I was desperate. Um, I, I didn't know how to pray when I couldn't really even concentrate for more than a few seconds. Um, and so I reached out to the Psalms and um, just started with a couple of verses. I had my, my phone, my Bible app, and I squinted with one eye, opened the other one, and just for as few seconds as I could, I tried to find a verse that would somehow lift me or encourage me or something I could sing in my head or hum in my head or breathe. And the, one of the first ones I came upon was Psalm 42. And there's a lovely little verse in there uh, that I found that says, by day the Lord directs his love, at night his song is with me. And I began to slowly uh, breathe those words in and out, thinking about all the times in life and in my present circumstances that God's love was with me. And also in the times at night, in the dark times, in the depressed times, anxious times, how God's love sustains us. I'm sure our listeners can hear, as, as I do, the deep heart that is in that wonderful recovery of your Psalm 42. But you, you have different moods that you seem to go through. It, it, it starts to build as you interact with the Psalms. Uh, tell us about I Wake, Psalm 3 and Psalm 24. Yeah, I Wake uh, was, was a psalm. You know, Psalm 3 is near the beginning of the Psalms. And it's a beautiful song of, of sustaining us through, through difficult things. And so often in our faith and in our life, we're trained or we learn that we need to give God something and to be feeling good about ourselves or, or sort of the things we're involved with and the prayers we're able to pray. And, and, and by, through that, somehow feel that God's affection is on us. But actually, you know, God sustains us when we can't do anything. And for me, there was a point where I really had to let go of my career or of the realization that I just might not do music again, which was very painful, uh, or be with people doing music again. I didn't really know at that point. Um, but I did know that regardless of what would happen in my life, um, that Jesus the shepherd would sustain me somehow through it. There's... There's some beautiful verses um, in the Bible that say that he's near the brokenhearted. And so I, I really, really felt the closeness of Jesus during these days where, you know, they were filled with a lot of resting on a couch or, or bed. Um, but I really felt God's pleasure um, on, on me during these days. I, I'm thinking of He Remembers Me, Psalm 105. Psalm 105 on your Psalms recording. Is that what's going on there? Totally, yeah. It, it is what's going on there. Uh, you know, I think there's a real tendency in our hard seasons that we feel forgotten or abandoned or forsaken. Uh, and there's something very, very special about being remembered, right? Um, that, that somehow, mysteriously, God walks through these hard things with us that 
that Jesus has walked through these hard things in life and continues to, by his spirit, walk with us through these things. That he's familiar with them. He understands the, the ache in our hearts. And he restores our soul through it. Um, he's, he's in there for the long haul with us. And so Psalm 105 talks about God remembering us. And in the song, I actually just used that idea of God remembering us. And I decided to write my own psalm. <laughs> and it starts out by just saying, The Lord remembers me in my lowest state. And he keeps me near his heart and restores my soul. And then it continues from the personal moving into the corporate. Um, and at the end, it sort of talks about how Jesus will, will actually make right the things that we feel that we've, we've really, really lost in life. Uh, that time isn't lost. Nothing's lost. Lord remembers me In my So, Mike, out of that very solitary experience of you recovering, of little bits of the Psalms coming back, blossoming into these beautiful Psalms, you take that very solitary experience of recovery and you begin to dream of organizing a retreat of friends to sing the Psalms, to sing these ideas that your isolation had given you. Tell us about that. Well, you know, it was, I, I don't quite know where the idea came from. I, I really should have, you know, I couldn't really hang out with people when this idea came to me, but I just felt really strongly that somehow these songs had to be sung with others. And the first thing we did was we gathered a few friends together at my house and they sort of listened to the Psalms and the night went pretty well. So I figured, well, let's, try a whole weekend of doing this. We'll, we'll record some video. I'll pull together sort of a whole bunch of people who know my journey and the hard things that we've been going through, but also are musicians or artists. Not necessarily professional, but definitely had have, have big, big hearts, both for us, but for God especially. And so we met at this lovely little retreat center called the Abbey uh, near Guelph, Ontario. And it's this old barn that got turned into this beautiful, almost like concert space. And so we all gathered there and my wife decided to do the food, which was amazing. And we started to play. The very first song we launched into was uh, Abounding in Love, which was out of Psalm 86. And my first thought was, oh no, what have I done? Because I actually couldn't hang out with people at this point for more than about an hour, hour and a half. And I had invited a whole bunch of my favorite people to hang out with us for almost two days without really any breaks and the whole time recording music. <laughs> and so we launched into this faith journey um, of, you know, singing and recording these songs. But as soon as my friends, the choir joined these songs, I mean, it was an extremely moving experience. Mike, I hear the community in that beautiful rendition of Psalm 86. What is your advice for being able to grow and to be cared for in community like you and Jody experienced? I, I'm, I mean, I'm amazed at what happens when a community joins around someone. Um, these songs, you know, as a community starts singing them, all these things that were so personal and intimate that I had sung to God just in my studio here, um, suddenly were magnified. And suddenly everybody's story turned up in that song. And it was very, very powerful. And my friend Steve Bell reminded me that this was a story of the Psalms. Um, it was a psalmist going through a really difficult time of exile, of desert, 
sometimes even of, of good things like rest and joy, and then writing a song and then the masses joining in and singing this, you know, whether they were walking together, whether they were joining the temple together, um, everyone singing this together, which is the story of the Psalms. And so something tremendously powerful hap happens when our stories are amplified, you know, together, when we share these things. My, my wife, Jody is phenomenal at connecting with people. Uh, it's one of her gifts. And in our church, um, she is someone who constantly is pulling people in to do different things. She's really great at pulling in people that you might not expect. And she's really great at including everybody. Um, and I think our story um, has a lot to do with, you know, my wife, Jody being so connected to our church. Um, for many, many years, you know, we, we've been there 25 years now, uh, Little Trinity Church in Toronto. And, you know, when we went through this, people just really quickly came to the forefront. Um, now, we accepted help, I guess. Maybe that's something we all can put into practice of actually accepting when people are willing to give help. Um, I think in our situation, we had no choice. I think we were going to be in big trouble <laughs> if we didn't. But um, developing community and choosing a church to be a part of and to grow in and to be nurtured in and to build into others, I think is a really, really important thing when, when things hit in life. We're going to play a little bit of royalty because I think you have discovered an abundance. And he lifts the poor from the dusty streets And he pulls the weak from the ash and heat Royalty to be called his sons and daughters. I can hear in your version of Psalm 113, Mike, that we've just been listening to, that celebration of being in community. Uh, but not too long after you got really used to being back in community again, after the concussion is recovering, COVID hits so difficult for musicians whose livelihood is performing in community. Uh, what did you experience in the shutdown? What were the losses that you learned, the ups and downs of COVID? Well, the truth is, Lorna, it felt eerily familiar. Um, when, it, when COVID shut the world down, I had just for about four months returned back to performing again for my concussion. It had taken a long time, four years plus, and I just committed to start playing again. And then the pandemic hit. Um, and so it felt very familiar. But what was super neat about the whole experience was for these four years leading up to it, I had been in isolation. I had been alone. And God had sort of been caring for me, sustaining me, and you know, provi providing these songs that were quite personal. And then suddenly the pandemic hit and what I had been going through, which felt quite isolated, suddenly everybody was isolated. And, you know, the times I had felt really alone, now everyone felt alone and times I'd felt unsure about work and about life and about community, everybody felt that. And um, at the retreat, what was so interesting about gathering together with the community was we were singing these songs and these psalms together with this pretty good gathering of people. And then two weekends later, the whole world shut down. My friend describes it as God was preparing a feast for the famine that he knew was coming. And so I felt actually quite encouraged <laughs> in the pandemic season, which was probably the exact opposite of all my musician friends. Um, but I somehow, what God had placed inside me or the songs that had been given somehow now were for everybody. And it was pretty cool to watch that encourage others. Um, it was, you know, all of us had to learn how to um, Skype, of course, and how to do concerts at home and online stuff. Um, There's a lot of learning curve. Most of my friends, you know, set up studios in their washrooms and kitchens and, you know, everybody was recording from home. But the other great thing about the pandemic is that suddenly every musician was available for booking. 
So if you were doing a recording like I was, and I was working on the Psalms project at home during the pandemic, um, I could phone anybody up and they'd say, yep, I'd love to, because um, nobody was on tour. So <laughs> on the Psalms project one and two that are out there, you, you know, you can get them on Spotify or wherever else. Um, you'll hear some fantastic musicians. And the main reason is they were all home, not doing a whole lot. And uh, so it's pretty easy to get them. Okay. In a moment, we're going to go to uh, one of my favorites uh, with those musicians and yourself, Psalm 16. But we do want to ask people to be sure to check out your website. Uh, Mike, give us our, give us your address. All your uh, Psalms products are there and uh, your story is there. Beautiful material. They can follow you there. Uh, tell us your website and where people can connect with you, Mike. Yeah, it's www.mikejansen.ca and Jansen's J-A-N-Z-E-N. If you're interested in checking any, any things out, there's a store there. Um, there's chord charts uh, there, free, as well as on praisecharts.com. Uh, They're free to, to sort of six of the most familiar ones. Um, there's CDs you can get there. There is a devotional book that goes alongside of the CDs with some great little devotionals. You can go through um, all 20 songs and there's different authors, Lorna's on there and other people. It's really a cool little booklet. And um, you can also, you know, through Spotify, Apple Music, any of the streaming services, you can uh, share it that way as well. And, you know, my heart just says, share it. If, if it. if it resonates with you and you think someone's going through a hard time, just share it. And um, I, I love that it's on all the streaming platforms because that's a nice, easy free way to sort of share things. I love it that your chords are up there for churches to download and and to practice and play and lead our congregations. I just um this could be um uh, this could be some of the new songs for church and Mike so the Psalms project is so fantastic. Uh Kerner Hall was outstanding post COVID. You fill one of the biggest venues in the city of Toronto. It really was very special, wasn't it? You know, it's one of those nights I'll, I'll definitely remember forever. Uh, it was a great gathering, too. I think people were just really, really excited to get out of the house, uh, to have life return to normal and actually go hear live music. Um, so it was very special for me, though. There was a choir there, the Alora Festival Singers, 13-piece uh, string section, a great band. Lila Bialy was singing. Um, and she was awesome. And, and, the, and the audience was just super, super engaged. And it was just very, very special. All right. Okay. We're going to conclude with Psalm 16. It overflows. It overflows. Mike, thank you for sharing with us, for uh, reminding us all that the Psalms are a treasure that God has for us to discover. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lorna. Lord, you are my portion, my cup overflows. You are my delight. You, my joy grows. Lord, you are my pleasure and lead me to peace through valleys and hills, beside quiet streams.